uh, to kickstart this uh, discussion, we would like to dig deeper into three main uh, themes, which is partnership, data, and platforms. Uh, I'd like to ask you guys to let us know about uh, what is the main importance of uh, partnerships in, in this digital era, and what has been the main role of partnerships in making sure that uh, we uh, bring out successful implementations of these digital platforms. Uh, I think I'll start off with Henry. Can you please take us through the kind of partnerships that you had to build for Arifu to take root uh, as far as you've gone? Uh, thank you very much, Happy. Um, so Arifu being a learning platform, uh, had to, we had to think on how best to be able to approach a partnership. Um, uh, we are not an expert uh, in content, um, in that we are not an expert in content for agriculture, we are not an expert in content for health or financial services. So uh, the natural thing for us was to look and around and say, where can we get sources of content that can be verified? And uh, the natural, um, uh, I'll say partners were, of course, one of them is government agencies. So uh, we have a partner called CALRO, uh, Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organization uh, in Nairobi and other partners. So we went to them and said, um, we have this wonderful channel, but we want to pass out relevant information. Today, if you go and Google, and I'm not attacking Google in any way, uh, you'll be able to get that information, but it's not from a verifiable source. So the first thing is for us to get a verifiable source, um, um, uh, source of authority. Uh, second thing uh, for us, we had also to think about what channels can we use. And that's the reason why uh, telecoms are a natural uh, partner for us. Because we need to distribute that content through an SMS or through a data um, social media network. So we needed to work with the telcos. Uh, uh, we procure short codes, for instance, uh, for different countries. Uh, so we needed to have that in place uh, to do that. Uh, thirdly, of course, uh, with the help of uh, Masico, whose AgriFin product uh, uh, program, rather, um, they, uh, of course, have a lot of deep expertise around agriculture, and um, you can hear right from their presentations um, what they've learned over the years and uh, leveraging also their partnerships together. Then the other thing is that uh, we've also um, come to the realization that. Uh, we cannot, of course, be able to do everything. In partnerships, uh, one thing that you acknowledge is that you can't be everything, and you can't do everything. You have to choose, uh, for you to be successful, you have to choose areas in which you are a subject matter expertise, experts and be able to allow other people who add on value. Um, the last thing is that uh, for commercial enterprises, uh, when you're going out to the commercial enterprises, um, the things um, that they look out for is that they want to be able to see um, a list of, or I would say, a group of, uh, um, of partners that are able to add value, uh, especially for their audiences. So uh, those are some of the things that we look at and say, um, yes, I think these are the guys you're going to be working with, and I think so far we've been very successful at it. Fantastic. Uh, that's good to uh, learn from Arifu. I think uh, I will allow all our panelists to share with us how uh, they've been partnering with other ecosystem players to make sure that these platforms are really uh, reaching out to the required customers in the market. So I think I can start off with Louis next to me here and then pass on to the rest. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to, again, kind of talk from a different perspective. Um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing is looking at the customer side of this, at the farmer side of this, and how do they make decisions for how they're going to you know, purchase different inputs and choose the crops, choose the fertilizers, and choose the, the selling method that they're going to, they're going to make. Um, I think a really important thing where partnerships come in in this is that it really simplifies people's decision making in a very complicated space. Farmers work with a lot of information and a lot of different people telling them a lot of things, often conflicting and often hard to understand. So, I mean, farmers have information coming from informal sources, from government extension officers, from NGOs, from private businesses, from seed uh, sellers, from off-takers, from all, all variety of sources. And we've been doing a lot of research with uh, Acumen 
in, in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda to kind of explore how people actually make decisions in these spaces. And we find that one of the biggest values that digital platforms provide is bundling. So by having multi-party um, multi -party digital platforms, farmers are able to basically simplify their decision-making processes. And so, I mean, one example of this is that uh, obviously insurance is a particularly not very demanded uh, thing in agricultural markets in Africa at the moment. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with Pula, where by partnering with, with seed providers, by fert uh, with fertilizer providers, they've been able to get insurance to the market a lot more easily than they would have otherwise. Uh, similarly, uh, we've been looking at Tula's model quite a lot, um, and how by providing support from start to finish with credit provision uh, for input purchase right through to information and market provision, they're able to do a lot more. Uh, and so I think from a customer perspective, it's really this bundling of opportunities that provides value to people. Uh, I think the second thing around partnerships is data sharing and the efficiency gains that you get through that. And I think we'll talk about that a bit more when we speak about data specifically. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of benefits from data sharing between partners, and I think there's a lot of duplication and there's a lot of data that's going uh, wasted at the moment. Um, and I think this is something that Mombeki talked about quite a lot around standardization. Um, but yeah, I think these two things are really the value that we see from the customer perspective is this bundling and, and data sharing. Yeah, uh, talking about partnership, uh at pass, uh, I will say that uh, that has been uh, the key for the success uh, of our work. We have connected about 1.1 million farmers to access credit from banks by developing their feasibility study, business plan, pitching to the banks, convincing bank to lend. We have facilitated uh, credit from banks that we work 16 banks in Tanzania of about now close to $400 million so far uh, up to now that we have guaranteed. And this, is not, this cannot be achieved without working with, uh, with, with a lot of partners. From the finance side, uh, our biggest partner, NMB, is in the room, <laughs> one of the banks that we work with. Uh, but it's not just banks when you talk about access to finance for farmers. You need partnerships from other service providers, like input suppliers, uh, like uh, extension services providers, etc., cetera, et cetera. But so this ecosystem of partnership is, is what makes us deliver the value to the farmers. Now, going into the digital platform, uh, now we're working for these services to be on the digital platform. And that's what I just said about developing a digital credit guarantee platform, pushing banks, telecoms, and other digital credit lenders uh, working together uh, and actually push credit uh, to, to, the, to the farmers so that farmers can access it. But also, uh, on parallel to that, we are building uh, what we call a knowledge hub, uh, where we we can tap all this great work done by different platforms. Uh, you have had people working on the on the input space, on the knowledge space for the farmers, and there's so many out there that are really adding value to the farmers. But how do we package this information and deliver it to the farmer in an easy way and easily accessible way? Okay, um, I think I think the word I'll take from you there is uh, ecosystem. And um, for us, we find uh, we've gone into um, agribusiness, which is a very complex um, ecosystem to be in. Uh, to work through that, we have to um, uh, practically uh, assess and vet the partners that we work with uh, with the mission that we have to actually drive uh, not only um, our business um, requirement but also the impact that comes out of it. Okay, so we work with a mix of learning partners, which with um, um, Mexico being one of our key learning partners, FSTT is another one. We work with uh, UNCDF, WFP. We consider them a lot more like learning partners. Uh, in some instances, of course, they, they fund uh, some of our learning events, like uh, uh, if we go into the field and we need to test out um, uh, if farmers would like our product, we, we work with, with these partners to actually get that, get that done. Um, on top of that, we 
are a data-driven company, and um, data is something that I think um, is uh, either controversial or it's something that is uh, treated as uh, the new gold. And we find um, in working with partners that really understand uh, data and how to use it, how to manage it, we actually can build a platform that is actually um, uh, a, a world-class platform. Uh, you're looking at, um, uh, Becky, especially you were talking about uh, these big platforms like um, uh, Amazon and, and Alibaba coming into Africa to offtake produce and actually sell it in the global market, right? So we want to be in a position where by the time they come, they are actually looking at us rather than uh, looking to go to the last man because this is why we're here. We are, we are right with the people, so why don't we actually partner with the people we have here and then expose that uh, one API, open API to these guys to actually now do the, the other bit and, and provide uh, a better income, a better livelihood for the people we serve. Um, I think I'll, I'll end there because we, we have a lot of partners, okay, including banks, MNOs, uh, and everyone else in between. Hi, I guess my story is very similar to everybody else. Um, I think there are different partnerships. One are like with organizations like Musico. Um, we provide a platform to our clients, yet they want to measure impact, how many farmers have they achieved. So through our clients, I know how many farmers we have signed, in our, signed up in our platform. And I can share that information with them, so they know how indirectly they actually reached out to how many farmers. Um, then, in addition, what we do is, we are very good in providing, can you hear me? Um, we are very good in managing supply chain management, different value chains. This is, this is our expertise. Now, there are lots of people that are very good in different other things. And um, whether it's um, weather forecast or whether it's um, soil um, um, content or whatever. So we have a platform that can, in which you can feed in all that information. Our weather partner, for example, he has this extreme clever platform, but no means to reach any smallholder farmers, yet this is what he wants, right? So I think there's a lot of knowledge outside there that is somehow stuck at a very high level and will never reach the farmers. So we see ourselves as a platform um, that can help you as a user to actually integrate and disseminate that information to your farmers through an API or other integrations. And then, yeah, and this is basically selling additional services um, jointly as a strategic partnership to farmers. Um, and that can be weather forecast, that can be crop insurance, um, with financial institutions we partner. They are using our data to, um, to then do an alternative credit scoring or um, offer input packages to the farmers. So there's a lot that you can do if you work together. Um, thank you very much. Um, I can see Ali taking a lot of notes here, ready to respond to this. So I'm going to twist this a little bit because um, oftentimes when we talk about partnerships, um, everyone wants to talk about the good thing. You know, it's great to have partnerships. It works well. So why isn't it working? Why are the startups and a lot of the companies here struggling to sit down with Voda and partner on your great Digifarm or whatever you're going to call the platform? What are the challenges they're facing in terms of working with you? How can you make it easier for them to walk into the doors and build relationships? It's great that we've had you've built a relationship with Arifu. What does it take to form these partnerships? And also to the audience, I mean, please share your questions. What are the challenges you have faced in terms of forming partnerships with NMB, um, with CRDB? Who else is here? I want you guys to share those experiences. Because until we start talking about these issues and we start to solve them, it's going to be another workshop, and we'll walk out of here, and in the marketplace, you'll be faced with the same problems, trying to call up someone, never getting a meeting, never getting emails responded to. So let's get to the root cause. What is going on? So I'll allow Ali to address some of these issues. And then, audience, please um, talk, share with us your perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, the, I, I think the first thing that uh, maybe Vodacom was uh, uh, a bit scared, maybe, we, this is a very new thing in, in our space. And, and, and we were like a bit cautious in the first place who to partner with because uh, once we explored into, uh, into this space and 
in our understanding, what uh, challenges even Safaricom faced was like um, uh, you have 1,000 uh, partners across and everyone is an expert in their space and everyone maybe have their own interest and, 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 and a lot of such stuff. So um, we are being quite cautious in who we start working with so that uh, we don't make uh, similar mistakes uh, with our other partner markets. Uh, that is one. Two, every, every partnership comes a cost in it and, uh, you, you know, budgets are quite uh, complicated in terms of uh, getting them approved and uh, 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 moving forward. Could, uh, third could be government uh, policies and um, here you're allowed to work with this one. Tomorrow you, you're quite limited and in some other way. Um, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of um, uh, other aspects that Vodacom is looking into. So, yes, we do welcome, but it takes a while. It takes a while to pick one. And, um, and I know everyone is interested, and we are also interested to work with each one of you. But, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think the, the difficult part is that is the area that I can say. No. Thanks. That's, that's a very candid response. Anyone from the audience? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Please, can I have a microphone at the back? This question is for Ali. Um, so my understanding of how DigiFarms works in Kenya is that you know they've partnered with somebody for agro inputs, partnered with Arifu for information sharing, which is iProcure in Kenya, I think. And I know iProcure probably by virtue of this partnership was able to do like a Series A, raise a lot of financing around it. What what spaces is Mezzanine looking to fill? Will Mezzanine do its own agro inputs? Or will it look for a company like iProcure in Tanzania? What sort of gaps is Mezzanine, well, sorry, what, what services is Mezzanine bringing together? Uh, Mezzanine is just giving us an empty box. It's just a platform. And uh, we take that platform forward. So they're just technical experts in that area. They know exactly what to, uh, how to design it. So if we face any challenges and we want to move it forward, we ask them to tweak it. Because Mezzanine is now Vodacom, because we acquired that company. So they only provide the platform. So what they feel in is just the expertise in terms of technical uh, capability of the platform. That's it. And um, uh, that platform is capable of uh, interacting or working with any other platform that is across that we feel that we need now to move in. Like Safaricom, they started one, one platform at a, after another, I mean, uh, interacting with one platform after another. And then we decided, yes, let's start with Arif, and then we'll put in another platform, and put another platform to make sure now Tanzania moves. But Mezzanine is just a platform. I, I notice it's not live yet. What's the timeline for? It is live, as oh, you speak. The website says come back later. Sorry? <laughs> OK, the, the website needs to be updated, I think. OK. Um, um, Thanks for that. Um, so I have a question. I think there are bankers in the room. How many bankers are in the room? Uh, raise your hands and don't hide. <laughs> yeah, don't hide. OK, so, so, so what does it take for tech, ag tech, fintech companies to partner with yourselves? We've all seen what has happened in the credit market. Before um, the telcos partnered with banks, to be able to issue out instant credit. It was so hard to get a loan. Now, anywhere across the street, you can pick up and get money without borrowing from someone begging or going to a Shylock. Such partnerships have been such a success and have revolutionized digital credit in urban markets. But yet, there are other spaces that are struggling. So what will it take for you guys to actually have an open door policy um, to other value service providers working closely with you? Anyone? Oh, I can pick you out. <laughs> you have to go on. So shall we start, John, right next to you? But anyone, actually, anyone who's got some ideas around that, how can we make it easier to work with banks? Yes, uh, morning. It's afternoon now, yeah? So um, for me, um, uh, it takes uh, threefold um, to run things on the show. One is the business case. Um, in any situation that we engage partners, we look at the business case that uh, can really pay back the bank in the sort of uh, cause of a short-term period. 
So that is number one which uh, we consider for any engagement for a collaboration. And uh, there are two more elements. Uh, I think the second one is the, the affordability element. I think that touches uh, both uh, the bank side but also the customer side because anything to onboard new uh, partner and collaboration will entail whether their customer will be able to pay for that services. And I think on here, I think I'll also ask the panel and how, what is the best approach you as a partner to ensure other partner that can afford your business or your case that you present forward. So I'll be very curious to know exactly how do we feature the affordability element in any partnership engagement. And the third uh, thing is the scale. Uh, I think this go in line also with the risk element because if you expand too fast, uh, when you engage a partner, I think the element of us, how would we feature the issue of managing the risk along that expansion? And the scale for us is very important, but uh, I think we also need to consider what are the risks behind it and how do we tackle when we discuss on the partnerships. I think those three elements probably could be one of the responses from the panel to help me decide. Thank you. Great. Um, anyone else wants to add from the banking community or shall we go to the panel? And I know Mombeki had a question, yeah. Yeah, please. All right, um, my name is Jessica Tsompala. I'm from the Zambia National Commercial Bank as an ACO, and I think Christabel highlighted um, the works that we've been doing with, um, with uh, Agrifin. So I just thought I could also just uh, maybe share some of the learnings that we've had in, in Zambia with regards to, to partnerships. I think from, from the start, as, as a bank, we obviously have, were skeptical initially because we needed to assess how viable this was. We're looking at a, a, a smallholder farmer who doesn't bring in as much income as, as, as possible. And so through a human-centered design, as was, was mentioned, we designed and developed a product which we're calling um, AgriPay. In terms of partnerships, I think number one would be to have an anchor partner. So Agrifin has been instrumental in guiding us on how to you know, de develop the product, what to do, and even the partnerships that we, we, we forged. Secondly, it was also looking at us, ourselves as a bank, what strengths do we have? So obviously, number one is that we are providing financial services. So we were, we were able to leverage from our current uh, platforms that we have. We have a transaction account, we have a savings account, we have, um, we're able to provide credit. So for us, it was much easier. But we realized that we were not experts in the other, in, in the other fields. And so we started with various partnerships by looking at which one was the right partnership and where would we gain or leverage from? How would we increase stickiness of, of these smallholder farmers to our bank? And so we looked at each partner having different or unique um, characteristics. For instance, we are currently working with the Cotton Association of Zambia. This is a women-centric organization with about 70% being women. And we have um, a, a target to reach out to many women in, in Zambia. And we thought this is a good partnership because we know women are loyal. We know that women will definitely be part of, of, the, of the banking system for a while. Secondly, is that they already provide financial literacy for their farmers. So prior to our account opening, they would have taught the farmers on how to save, how to invest, and, and have also been part of the onboarding process. So an example would be when we go to open accounts, you'd find that even the staff and the Cotton Association of Zambia are part of the onboarding process. And I think we thought that was quite unique. They'll be there during the sensitizations. They'll be the first to speak and then say, oh, now Zanako have a product that will meet your particular needs. We had another organization called Mosika that has been uh, providing capacity building to agribusinesses. So p capacity building, technical assistance, and sometimes a bit of financial assistance. These have connected us to the agribusinesses that have enabled us to open agencies for the bank. So right now we're looking at almost 350 agencies that we've opened, comprising of agri-dealers, aggregators, and various organizations in the agri space. 
UNCDF was also um, a, a good partner that we, we got on board. They provided funding for us to test a concept called the booster team uh, concept, which they had tried in, in Uganda. So you take a team on the ground and they literally create an ecosystem. So they will go open accounts, they will also open agencies, and they will try also to ensure that these uh, farmers are actually transacting. So we, we thought that was very useful as, as well, and they contributed to about 3,000 farm, uh, farm accounts that we opened. Lastly, there are many other partnerships, but lastly, I will also touch on WFP, who we signed an MOU with. So initially, when we went to them, we were targeting their farmers and saying, look, you've got almost a million farmers. Could we open these accounts? And they said, look, for this to also work, we want you to support us because we want a trade financing facility for our aggregators. So they have these aggregators that provide, that buy produce from the farmers, and then they supply to WFP so that they can supply to different countries. And they said, they do not have the capacity. How can you help them as a bank? So right now we're working on a trading facility uh, product for them so that as these agribusinesses are growing, in turn the farmers will also be growing accordingly. Um, I, I can probably touch on, but I, I know others have to speak, but I think that that has been um, our experience and some of the learnings that we've had as the NACO. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, Mombeki had a question or comment. Thanks. Um, I think the partnership question is actually very important, and I think we um, it's, it's, it's a critical one to look at both from an enterprise or an institution perspective, but also from an industry ecosystem perspective. Um, to me, a, a successful platform is an outcome rather than an output. So regardless of our individual efforts and, and direct MOUs, uh, the, the platform will have a life of its own. So the question becomes, who's driving the partnership? I think who is driving the partnership is probably more important than what partnerships you, you get into. Uh, the challenge becomes, I think, for our industry now, the, the enterprise themselves are driving their partnerships. Uh, so then you become selfish and you want to do everything, uh, which is never efficient. It could be the best platform is a combination of all of you guys. Who will buy all of you and do, do, create one platform? or who will come and regulate so that you operate in a certain way. I think that now is now the, the thing we have to think about. Uh, individuals wanting to do things is, has been done and is, being, is going on. Uh, those outputs of having a platform on the um, live is, is there, but the outcome of it now really taking off is what we're not seeing. So I think we need to ask those partnership questions on the second level. Thanks very much for those comments. Um, I, I think we can move on. We cannot exhaust this partnership question, but I think that's a start. Um, one last question or comment? Question. Sure, sure, sure. Like I said, we can be here till 2 o'clock, so no worries. Yeah. Um, then we'll have lunch after that. Okay. Just my, mine is just related to just based on the discussions, because I think the, the, the baseline is two questions. The first is, are we ready to have as banks or financial institutions, whether MNOs or banks. So when we have the discussion on ROI, at the end of the day it comes on return on investments and it's coming year on year. Agri is a good thing that most of the time probably we talk about, but we haven't seen that kind of commitment to be able to include it because of the ROI. Thing. So are we ready to have a more critical decision based on this arrow, I think. I know it's risky, but then how do we cover that? Secondly, that leads me to the FinTech question. One of, way, one of the ways is partnerships. We see a lot of the banks already discussing in some form or have started some partnerships with this kind of financial technology companies. But we haven't seen this kind of big scale revolution. They haven't like maybe well integrated with them. All these kind of issues that are already there. So that again is the next big question we have to answer. What do the banks think? Are they going, do they think it's worth it? Because I know they're discussing the fintechs a lot. Do they think it's worth it and how risky is it to integrate or maybe work with them? Um, or do they think uh, some banks already are working around having part these elements already within the banking system? So is that the direction that is 
that we are likely to take. I think that is the more like the key decisions probably. Yeah. I know regulation will sort some of that, as Mombeki said, but that is just my take. Thanks for those great comments. Please make sure um, before you give your comments, you just give your name and organization so that we can also record that. Um, I'd like to hand over back to Happy and we can take a different topic because partnerships key. Um, we've got two other topics we want to talk about and hopefully we can um, wrap this up in the next 30 minutes. Yeah, thank you, Sika. Uh, moving on, uh, thank you so much for your participation. It's really encouraging. Uh, we are going now to look at uh, data. Uh, with clearly, with all these uh, partnerships and uh, all these uh, data and uh, all these uh, platforms that we are forming, there's a lot of data that's been generated out of it. How are we going to make sure that we make use of this data and uh, deliver more impactful solutions that will impact fa farmers and the ecosystem in general? So basically, I would like to ask our, uh, our friends uh, here in the panel, uh, Arifu uh, Busara Pass in DMA to take us through uh, some of the use cases that they have seen as far as data is concerned. I'll start off with Nikomed, who's sitting very close to me here. Uh, uh, thank you, Happy. Talking about data uh, in agri-lending, uh, we work with banks, uh, and there is a lot of data that is sitting with banks on, on agri-lending, and there has been regulation in the, in the recent past uh, for the banks to share the credit data with the credit uh, reference bureau. Uh, as, is, as it today, uh, for those who have subscribed to the credit info, for instance, can access data on on, uh, on lending by different clients in this country. But uh, as institutions like PASS, uh, we have over 20, about 20 years data now on on credit guarantees in agri sector, and that data is not open to anybody because uh, we are not regulated by the central bank. <laughs> But it's a rich data that can really make a difference uh, if, uh, for people to make certain decisions. And there are a lot of institutions out there who have data. And uh, the different uh, platforms that have been built uh, on, on whether it's you know, on input uh, logistics or input distribution or on farm aggregation, there is a data uh, there that we can actually build on to make certain decisions. To, uh, to push the agri-lending in, uh, in Tanzania. But then, all these are not open. So, because of seeing this gap, uh, PASS is embarking on a very ambitious project on building a knowledge hub that will aggregate all this data and make it available to, uh, to, to, to those that will really need to access it. And we think that is the right way to go because uh, when we provide this kind of access, uh, this access to data then uh, will, will open certain opportunities in the sector. But there are also challenges. Uh, institutions that are holding this data are, all, are not really open. Uh, some of the data is proprietary and they are not really. Uh, so, that, so we have to work around that challenge on how do we really get this data out of, of these institutions. Okay, thank you. Um, I think on data, uh, again, I, I, I told you it's, um, it's, it's a complex um, subject, um, but for us, we believe that um, data is, is a list of farmers if it's not used to actually make a business uh, sense for, for those farmers. So I think, Mubeki, again, I will refer to you, uh, you mentioned about the standards of, of data. They, they's, different aspects of standard. Um, uh, it could be uh, standards of actually the, the usage of that data, uh, data sharing standards, and, and um, the actual um, how do you maintain that data on your platform. We find, uh, we have a system um, uh, from our good partners, Sasa Solutions, um, which basically what it does is it keeps the data live, okay? Most of the data that we are talking about is actually in a static situation uh, where uh, you can go on, uh, uh, for example, if I talk uh, about uh, our agro-dealer situation. Uh, right now, what is happening in there is you give these guys a solution which is book-based, uh, so they put their ledger there and they're able to record all their sales there. But what happens is when they... Um, uh, leave uh, to actually start thinking, what did I order last year? What, did, what should I order this year? 
they are not able to go page by page to actually go through this. So how do we make that data live to a situation where uh, even a machine actually makes the decision for them? Okay, um, we have, I really wanted um, uh, our partner to talk about how we do um, customer engagement for us to have a good mix of um, the telco data, uh, alternative data that we have on, on the ground, and the data that is actually coming through uh, the transactions that, that are happening. Um, uh, maybe you could give me a, a chance to, to just put you on the spot. Um, uh, do we have a mic? For, <laughs> for Andre to just say something around that area because I think it will be a lesson for, for others uh, because we really like um, the platform that we have because of that. Very open to that. Please, this is a dialogue that we must have um, to improve the ecosystem. So um, all comments are welcome. And yeah, please. And it's not a, a plug. It's, it's literally um, a lesson learned from, from where we started off uh, to where we are now with, with the platform they have. Yeah, um, thanks, Rob. Um, I think uh, you touched on the, the, the key aspect there is that um, a lot of data is very static. Um, you know, the AMCOs have been collecting data on their farmers for a number of years, as an example. But these papers are sitting in boxes in storerooms all over the place. And even if one digitizes all of that um, information, it's, it, it has value. But over time, that value is eroded. So it's really a case of how do you, how do you maintain the, the relevance of that data over time? Um, and, and I think through platforms, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a key feature is the ability to capture all the engagements that one has with the farmer, whether it's over USSD um, from just straight engagement or whether it's through an actual transaction, whatever the case might be, the idea is that um, that engagement and that um, data and or interactions at least should be captured to create uh, meaningful information and update the farmer profiles that are that are on the on record to be able to better understand the various um, various farmers and be, be able to segment them because once you're able to understand them better and you can segment them you're able to actually determine who is most appropriate to lend um, or offer financial assistance or whatever the case might be and, and then it, it offers a, a much more um, fluid and dynamic engagement with that farmer in that it's, it's a lot more appropriate um, just through dynamic data and understanding. Um, I'm not too sure if there's anything else you wanted me to you go into. Yeah. I think taking on, we can uh, hear from Arifu on how they're making use of data where uh, people are learning through their platforms and getting uh, meaningful uh, use cases out of it. Uh, thank you very much, Happy. Um, I think we've come to a time that collecting data for the sake of collecting data is going to end. And, and that's becoming reality with GDPR. Um, uh, in Kenya, for instance, you have a data protection law that was enacted and active on the 25th of uh, November last year. So the questions that we've started asking ourselves uh, at Arifu is that what do we need to do to be able to make sure that we are compliant. Uh, for instance, you need to start having a data officer, for instance, in your organization, so that you can be able to uh, put uh, that data into one, make sure that there's protection to it, but the right people access that data. Um, for us, uh, we've seen farmers interact with content. Uh, the beauty about our systems is that we are able to draw behavior patterns analytics around it. Uh, for instance, if you put out a module that has uh, about 20, 25 messages, uh, on average you can be able to tell you at a very individual level how deep that particular farmer has interacted with the content that you put there, which is a very important factor. Think about it. Uh, today, our friends at the telco side is that you, when you send an SMS, Yes, the SMSC tells you that message has been delivered. But what actions happens after that is difficult for you. You might uh, be able to see a little bit of your campaign, people responding to a, a particular product, subscribing to it, but you cannot be able to tell you, uh, to tell you what they are doing with it. So for us at Arifu, we have adapted a two-way message. 
So we mimic a USSD functionality. When you send content out there, people opt in. Um, at any time, someone can stop, carry on with your business, and go back to the same content. So when I work with you as a partner organization, I'm able to tell you how deep did your customers uh, go into the content? What were the specific areas? How much time also did they spend? Uh, we are able to layer in surveys, questions, uh, quizzes, and things like that to be able to affirm, did the person understand the content that you put out there? So at Arifu, we use uh, the data that you have very actively to be able to inform the partnerships around us and how better to engage with your audiences. Uh, uh, in some instances, of course, we've used A-B testing to be able to put one set of information to, um, to a different group and be able to see what resonates better. Uh, it could be your marketing campaign. You want to uh, talk about a particular product. Uh, what is the approach that you're going to use? Um, uh, what are the, uh, what's the language you're going to use? Is it going to be narrative-based? Uh, what are people responding to? So we actively use um, uh, the data that we receive and to be able to make sure that we make the products better, we have a better engagement uh, with the users that you have, uh, and at the end of the day, be able to bring value to you so that uh, when you run um, a different campaign, you run a different product, you run a different outreach, you are able to know in almost certainty that you're going to have better results uh, than other campaigns that you've been running. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Busara. Louis will take us through uh, lots of data work that they've done and how uh, they're seeing that uh, this data can inform a lot of different use cases out there. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I think there's a couple of different themes or buckets around how data can be used really effectively that we've seen again and again and work with our partners. Uh, the first one's really around data sharing, which I think everybody's touched on and has been uh, kind of an undercurrent of this whole conversation. And so it's how do you get data that's been collected for one purpose to be shared with people that can use it for another purpose. Um, I think credit is obviously a use case which has raced ahead with this and has done a lot of work in... Uh, building formal and alternative sources of data to support credit scoring. Uh, it's a really big thing in Tanzania, obviously, especially uh, as Nick Ahmed says, now that Credit Info, uh, the, all the digital credit firms are going to be listing both positively and negatively on Credit Info going forwards. Uh, people like PASS do a lot of work in uh, credit guarantee schemes using sources of alternative data, Farm Drive, uh, Tula, there's, there's lots of organizations that are working in this at the moment. So this is probably a space that's, that's been very effective in, in driving it as, as these credit firms look to see how they can improve their credit scoring models using whatever data is available. Um, I think one thing to note is that there are a lot of other use cases and a lot of other data sets that are still not necessarily being used to the degree that they could be. And a few of the people that we work with, we've been trying to see how we can improve what they do by incorporating new sources of data. Uh, I think one thing to think about is is looking at insurance and the data that they collect. So we do work with Pula. Uh, obviously, Pula collects a lot of very interesting data. So they collect yield estimates, which they combine with satellite imagery and weather forecasts to be able to come up with really accurate kind of location-based uh, yield estimates. This is something that's obviously very useful for insurance, but it's also something that's very useful for a variety of other services. And so this enables them to work with C providers to de-risk what they're doing and in turn offer cheaper services which allow them to subsidize insurance. So it kind of works as a nice holistic ecosystem here. Uh, I think there's lots of other sources of data, so off-taker data, uh, potentially cooperative or aggregated data, NGO data, the kind of data that anybody who's working with farmers on extension services um, might be collecting as well. It's very useful for, for marketing, for for input suppliers and fertilizers and, and, and other, um, other supplier services to farmers to be able to target and to market their products a lot more effectively. Uh, this said, I think as this has been done, uh, what Mombeki was talking around, around standards and packaging is a really, really important facet as you're doing this. I think it's not easy to share data, as everybody knows. I think data is often either very, very messy and unstandardized and almost unusable. 
in which case the first step is to pull it into a kind of a shareable format which isn't gameable and which is uh, which fits a set of understandable principles. Um, I think another one is data diplomacy, uh, which Nick Ahmed touched on a few times, uh, discussing that there's a lot of people sitting on a lot of data and they're not necessarily sharing it for various reasons. Um, I think the undercurrent of this is how do you incentivize people to share data? How do you come up with agreements between firms? And then also when it comes to farmers, how do we incentivize them to share data that's appropriate um, to, to share with, with other providers? And then, yep, the last thing to talk about, which uh, Henry definitely talked about, uh, was data protection. And this is a huge new thing when it comes into data sharing. This is something we're now working with our partners to try and figure out how does the new GDPR compliance data protection law in Kenya in particular, which will probably be replicated in other markets, how does that affect people's ability to collect data for one purpose, which will then be used for another purpose? And there's a lot of different parts of that regulation which affect it. So yeah, I think data sharing is, is definitely the first bundle, which is, which is a really interesting way in which data is used. The other bucket is kind of how do you actually now use the data when you have it, whether this is data you've collected or whether it's data that's been shared with you. Um, I think one of the beauties of digital platforms is that they really allow for very quick and easy feedback loops and experimentation. So in terms of feedback loops, um, this kind of constant data, as, as you were mentioning, being collected that's updated is fantastic for being able to uh, to reevaluate what you're doing and optimize what you're doing. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Halatel previously where we did exactly this, where we looked at the data on the Halayako product and we tried to map different uh, metrics against each other. So take up and usage and agent performance and agent incentives and map them geographically to see where might there be mismatches and where might there be changes that we could do. We also worked with Pula to look at their referral system and see when it's been effective and when it hasn't and who are the type of people that are the best at referring other people that are also kind of good customers. So we were able to use the huge data set that they've been collecting to directly optimize the performance of what they're trying to do. Um, and I think experimentation as well is, is really vital. So this A-B testing that Arifa were doing, uh, this is something which is very, like the digital platforms are very set up to be able to do, is to allow you to, to test small tweaks in the services that you're providing or the marketing or the incentives that you're providing and see how these change uptake uh, really quickly. And you can run lots of tests very quickly and iteratively to build on what you're learning. And I think people like M. Copper are particularly very good at that. They have a whole team in-house, which is their data science and experimentation team, which does this. Uh, and then the final thing that we've done quite a lot of is using data to support segmentation. I think this is something that a lot of people do in, in some ways. I think it can be improved. I think a lot of the banks have rather broad segments, which, you know, mass market is a is a very large segment, uh, typically speaking. Um, one of the bits of work we do is moving from simply demographic segmentation to behavioral segmentation. So as we start collecting this updated data and this very thick data on people, uh, we can actually segment them based on how they behave, how they interact with the platform. And through doing that, that's a really effective way at, at driving different products, different services, and different communications. So looking at people who have interacted strongly, people who interact in a certain way, if you're collecting questions that people have been asking on, on how they can run their farm, that's a really good basis to then target certain information or certain inputs at those people. Um, so yeah, I think, I think broadly speaking, this data sharing and then using data is, is two of the things that we do a lot of work of, which are very interesting. Um, so, to the banks, the telcos, the large agribusinesses, you are sitting on a treasure trove of information that will be valuable to transform the agricultural sector, to transform the way we deliver services to various sectors in the economy. It's like you've put money in the mattress, yeah, and you don't want to play around with it. Yeah? And I know there's regulations. We all know there's restrictions, there's privacy, etc. But there are ways around it. There are ways around you can actually protect that data and allow the experts to come in and make sense of that. Yeah, do their data analytics, make sense of that data, and help build the right pro propositions, the right products, um, target the right market so that these platforms can actually work. Yeah? 
So let's not sit back on this information. Let's not sit, sit on it. Yeah? Get, create opportunities. It goes back to the same partnership question. How do I open the doors yeah, for the right people, the right minds to sit behind our data and help us make the right decisions? Right now, the whole world is chasing um, data for machine learning for artificial intelligence. They are coming up with automated devices, automated consultancies, ways in which they can actually make their lives better. We are lagging behind here in Africa. We, it's not that we don't have the information, we have it. But we, no one is making an effort to bring it together. So someone has to start doing this work. Yeah. Um, I'll jump into the last part of this uh, conversation, which is closely linked to the data. Uh, it's about active usage, active usage rate. Yeah. So we've got partnerships. We've got data. How do we get these platforms to foster active use, especially in the rural markets? How do we get digital f platforms moving and flying and people actively um, utilizing these solutions? So um, anyone in the panel would like to talk about your experiences in terms of getting people to actually use digital solutions or farmers to use digital solutions um, in the markets that you work off with? Rob, I can see you're nodding your head, so I'll, I'll pick you first. Shouldn't head, nod my head next time. Um, I think I don't even have to go to the farmer first. I, I, I look at myself, okay? I have a, a very peculiar way of life where I do walk uh, um, at uh, 5 p.m. Um, but um, during the holidays, uh, I think from the 20th all the way to the 2nd of um, 20th of, uh, uh, December, I decided to lodge it properly and um, I did not exercise, right? Uh, the end result was I ended up um, actually falling sick and I didn't uh, work for another week into, into studying work. Um, but funny enough, I, I have an app on my phone that was telling me, Rob, you need to exercise tomorrow. And it tells me again the next day, um, Rob, I think you need about um, six kilometers today. Um, to catch up on what you have done, um, and then it tells me again and again and again, and I don't listen to it. Okay, so in a way, if if we are sitting on on the data, like you said at, at the beginning, um, the systems are not going to be used. Um, I can have the app that tells me everything that I have uh, to do uh, to make my business work as a farmer, but if 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 it's not valuable to me, if I'm not seeing the value of that platform and that information that is trying to give to me, then there's, there's nothing. It's, 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 it's just porridge in, in the morning, which you can have or not have. Um, and I think that's my, my, my take on, on platforms. We have to uh, make uh, platforms that are usable, um, but not, not only usable, platforms that um, incentivize me to actually use them just because they are there not because I have to give you money or a voucher to actually get you to go and shop at my um, agro dealer, okay? Uh, we have a, I told you, we have a, a, an ordering system uh, which the farmers can use, okay? Uh, those farmers are not gonna use that, that platform if we haven't designed it properly. So we acquire the services of Busara, for example, Dalbeck, get these platforms um, actually singing the right tunes to the people who are going to use them. It's pointless to actually just roll it out because we can all roll out uh, platforms here. Um, and, and that's my take. I just take it from where Rob left it, is that um, think about yourself. Um, you engage with a system, with a platform, with content that is relevant and timely. Uh, if users or farmers are going to go uh, to utilize uh, services or tools that we put out to them, it has to be relevant to them. Um, the assumption that I think this farmer has no access uh, to the internet, this farmer probably doesn't have access to more sophisticated channels that I have, probably are stupid. They are not. They have peer groups where they get relevant information, timely information, uh, 
traditional methods they have used in the past to be able to take care of uh, certain items around their farming. And, and what we've done at Arifu is to make sure, and we, we've seen, whenever we do not put fresh, relevant content, the usage drops. Because once I have learned the two, the three modules that I need to learn, what's the need for me in it for me to go back to the system? So we've constantly have challenged ourselves to say, what partnerships do we need to have in place? Goes back to the partnerships in place to be able to pull in relevant data. But also number two is that what is that customer or what is that farmer interested in? They really went through um, a module on maize. Are they interested with the same information of maize? Is there something, something else that they need to learn? Do they need to start thinking about how do I budget? Uh, for instance, um, uh, um, how do I make my business, uh, my farming as a business? So those nuances that you get out of interaction within the system helps us think about what is the next thing that a farmer is looking at. Um, uh, this person is a farmer, yes, but they have an, an entire life around them. They are a parent, they are a leader, they uh, run a business somewhere um, um, and things like that. Uh, they are an influencer within the community. What are the other non-farmer content that can go out to them to be able to make them a better leader, a better business person, a better school manager, and things like that. So most of our farmers just don't do farming. They have a life out there. So by us learning uh, what else those farmers do, then we become very relevant to them because we give them the content that they require to be able to make them successful and uh, hopefully be able to make them better citizens within their countries. Um, anyone else wants to talk about active rates? Um, either a question to the panel in terms of how they've successively improved the active rates or how you have done it yourself in your experience. I need the microphone at the back, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a question on data that is also kind of intertwined with activity rate. Um, everybody spoke about collecting data and sharing data. If we assume that we can collect standardized data and we can share it between the different platforms, uh, uh, how should I say, well, um, what about leveraging the data? We didn't, we didn't, we kind of, at the end you kind of talked about it as well, but then we kind of skipped over and went straight to activity. Um, we have many platforms in this room that are looking to scale and become sustainable. Um, the thing of value that we all offer is our data. We know what farmers are doing, what they're growing, where they're growing, how they grow, what they need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how successful have, uh, has everybody else been um, with leveraging their data against other industries that are not in the tech side? For example, agro, um, saying we know what farmers are growing. Can you give us a discount? I know we uh, we we farms talked about getting discounts um, for your farmers using your data. Um, I think it's something that would be interesting to share between us, if anybody from the panel, uh, Arifu, if you guys have done it in Kenya, how successful you've been at leveraging your data against other sectors is basically my question. Can be answered from the audience as well. Um, so let's take that question and then we'll take the other one, yeah? I was just going to ask, there's so much talk about data and then as we collected from an individual farm holder level, a lot of that data is completely inconsistent. You talk to one farmer and they say, yeah, I own land. You ask them again, no, I don't own land. It's owned by my parents. There's some skepticism in terms of the client market. So I'm curious how much of that data mining is going through or how many times have you guys seen what's called spurious regressions or this kind of data coming through when actually as you run through it, it's inconsistent from a validation period or things like that. Because what we see on like the day-to-day -day as we register Phone numbers change, land ownership changes, you know, plot size changes, and there's a lot, um, as Andre was saying, there's a lot of demographics that continue to evolve at the, cult at the community level, be it deaths in the family or adoptions, so that, I guess, kind of panel data as you go forward is, um, how involved are you guys in that and kind of 
making sure kind of the evolution at these levels are in trends because this is still, the data is still within a 10 to 15 year new phenomenon. So I'm, I'm curious in the background how much of that is, is being considered to prevent false data being emulated based on historical trends, if that makes sense. Right. I think Justino was going to make a response to the first question or ask another question. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Justina. I'm from NMB. I head the innovation department. Um, I have a question to the panel, um, but before I have a question, I want to respond to what you had, um, I think, talked about earlier, which was around what are we going to do as banks or MNOs, what approach are we using in terms of the partnership with fintechs and the likes. Um, so we're not, basically from an NMB perspective, we're not going to do what uh, Vodacom has done, which is buy uh, an organization and, and, and put that together. But what we're doing this year is allow for um, the likes of many of you that are probably sitting in this room to come in and create for us products and solutions. So um, we're launching a, a partnership program, uh, which is going to be online, um, open, um, so an opportunity for any that has uh, created product solutions um, around the space in the agri space. Agri is one of the areas that, as a bank, we've been really focused on. Um, so we're going to make that easier, faster. Um, you've got platforms already. We don't want to create the same platforms. We want to leverage on what you've created already. Um, so you will see us doing that a lot of the, in the quarter one. Um, and, and that talks about the data sharing capability that we're going to be able to do. Um, we're, we're talking with um, BOT in terms of what are the limitations. There's a lot of um, policy. There's also a Consumer Act policy that has come out in Tanzania last year. So there's a lot of challenges around it, but we're working with, um, with the central bank around that. Now, my question is on the digital space. So I said I, I had innovation, which is we're supposed to take the bank from the traditional banking, where um, I think Zanako talked about really well, open accounts, get more accounts from farmers, but we don't want to do that only. We realize that is not enough. Um, so we need to go into the value art space. However, um, we all understand the literacy level in Tanzania is completely different from what it is in Kenya, in Zambia. We've got, our farmers are different. And, and, and I think uh, we work with PASS a lot, and we, you guarantee a lot of our loans, and we help doing credit facility for our, for, our, for our farmers. But we all know, digitally, it's very difficult to not only a farmer, most of us, to use these digital platforms. Um, I, a lot of us use mobile money, but we, we use it to cash in and cash out, as much as we use banks. So we have mobile banking platforms. The customers do exactly the same things. Now, my question is to us who are creating value-added solutions within the digital platforms. What has been, first, first of all, the tech, the tech of how are our farmers responding to these digital platforms? Um, that's my first question. Second, um, how do we make them better? And how do we work as a team? Because I don't think there's any organization that can tackle this. Um, I don't think the government can tackle this alone. Um, I think it's something that we we need to work in partnership to be able to do this better. Otherwise, it will always be a challenge for us. So to make me as a farmer be in your platform, respond to the questions, talk to the RIFU bots, um, it's going to be very difficult and different to do it in Tanzania. So I, I really want to hear from maybe the, the rest of the people sitting here. I think you guys in care are doing quite a lot of that within the groups and, and the rest. So let's have that conversation of how different it's going to be within Tanzania and what can we do differently. Thank you very much. So we'll take those three questions. Um, it's still raining outside, so no one is in a hurry to leave, I expect. Um, but yeah, we'll try and wrap it up after this. So three questions. The first question was about leveraging and monetizing data. What are your experiences? Have you been able to tap into that market? Trust me, it's okay to say, no, you've not been able to. That is also an agreeable answer. Um, the second question was on uh, misaligned data, um, errors in data. How do you manage a dynamic situation where people change phone numbers, etc., and how are you clearing up your data? And the last question there was about, or I touched on a bit about increasing usage. How do you get active use um, of your digital platforms um, across the board? Yeah. So anyone wants to go first? Okay, um, so let's go through the questions. The first one, we don't sell our data. 
or the data that our clients use. We basically have the different databases and we don't do anything with it yet. So we have planes for the future, but at the for the time being, we, we don't. Um, secondly, actual data. Data is only as good as a person collecting it. And I think it has to do with training and motivation of the people that collect the data. If you do pay your farmers through mobile money, the telephone numbers need to be correct. If you upload money into an account that is not existing or not no longer there, you can recover that money. There are things that you can do. But yeah, data is only as good as the people collecting it. And I think as long as you can motivate your people doing that, and I'm speaking from a perspective of um, agribusiness, right? You work with farmers, you need to collect from produce from farmers, you pay farmers, it's in your interest to have the data at any given moment as actual as possible. But that's planting information because you want to make projections um, and understand how how the produce is going to perform. And then on on the case with NMB, so we partner with financial institutions. Actually, financial institutions are now promoting our system and introducing it to their partners because they get data. They have the KYC data. They know where the farmers are, who they are. They have past production data. And I think there's very little information for farmers that is more valuable than actually money that has been paid by an off-taker to the farmers. Um, so they use actually this past financial transaction information for alternative credit scoring for farmers. And they develop together with and their agribusinesses input packages for the farmers to then provide these to the farmers. And they have tripartite agreements between the off-taker, the farmer, and the financial institution but then the off-taker gels the money through the bank account. So we have this integration to the farmer's account and the bank deducts whatever is outstanding. Um, so there, are, um, I think there are solutions that, that you can tap on, that you can work with. Um, so at Arifu, we haven't leveraged data, uh, especially for monetizing, um, because we work with different partners. But what you've done within pockets of specific partnerships is that um, there's a partnership in Kenya um, where uh, the bank has put out content about products and as soon as a user has gone through the entire content we have something which we call a callback uh, essentially a link uh, where the customer is able to tap uh, into that and then be able to for instance to save or borrow or get insurance uh, so the idea around that, uh, without giving too much information, is that um, how do we leverage that and do a revenue share, uh, for instance, and uh, be able to so become a lead generation of sorts uh, uh, for our partners, because we have very many partners. The challenge for us is that uh, we cannot use cross data across different partners, because some of the data is very specific to that particular partnership. And we do not want to be seemingly uh, poaching uh, a set of clients from one partner to the other. So that's the reason why we have to sort of box in uh, whatever offerings you're giving out. Um, in terms of, uh, yes, we know farmers sometimes have low literacy levels. And one of the things that we do diligently is... Uh, that we go out there and collect. Uh, so for instance, we, if we work with NMB, uh, we're able to look at particular use cases, get the content. Uh, we have to go out there in the field and test that content with the user. Uh, it's, uh, and if, if you know, uh, if you speak Kiswahili and read Kiswahili, is very different. Uh, it's, uh, if you're going to be doing the strict Kiswahili, it's going to be very different, uh, very difficult rather, for the end user who is a low level um, uh, literate person. So what we do, we mimic and do uh, mimic the street language within that locality. It might be Kiswahili, a version of it. Uh, we've just launched on Monday uh, with partnership with MasterCard, um, uh, product offering in Pigeon. So we're able to customize that offering for that particular audience, the education level, the exposure, uh, what language. So we will translate your material in English to that strict language um, um, in that particular, in, in the area of Mbea, what is spoken, what is the most popular language around there. We've experimented, of course, with um, social media 
uh, we are not yet into IVR, for instance. Uh, I know one, IVR is one of the ways um, you find that somebody is able to speak their mother tongue, but they cannot be able to read. So use cases around how IVR could be used uh, because it's a voice over. You'll be able to listen and they go next and next and next and hopefully be able to retain that information. So how we have seen farmers respond is that um, if we put out content that they understand, uh, content that is relevant to them, we've seen they've been very responsive. People argue that farmers don't read. Uh, I think it's the opposite. People only go to uh, content that they understand very well, uh, but number two, that is relevant to them. So if I am going to be pushing out content in Mbea about rice or something that is grown there, um, then I expect to be able to see uh, the farmer who wants to grow that rice, be able to follow step by step on how to do that uh, in a much better way. So there's a lot of more work to be done uh, to understand what are the motivations that cas uh, sorry, fast farmers have uh, to be able to interact with content. So we keep discovering that with the partnerships that we've put in place. And that's the reason why we like the vanilla of partnerships that we have, financial institutions, um, telcos, uh, other fintechs, and to be able to make that a reality. And, and we hope in the near years to come, you become better as, of course, use AI and machine learning to be able to understand all these nuances that come through the interaction of data and content. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe just a quick answer on the two data questions. Um, I think in terms of leveraging data, uh, there are lots of ways that it's going on at the moment and lots of ways that we work with our partners to leverage the data that they have and to, to use it well. I think the first thing is, is analytics. There's often quite a lot of talk of some of this you know, data science, machine learning, AI, all of these quite advanced things. I think sometimes we overlook the power of just doing quite simple data analytics and doing quite simple summary statistics. And the number of times we've worked with a client and we've kind of jumped ahead to to build uh, a machine learning model or to build you know, a neural network or something. And then we come back and it turns out some of the initial summary statistics about where their people are, how their people are behaving, uh, who, are, who are their segments that are performing particularly well and who aren't. That's the stuff that really interests people and allows them to make informed decisions. So simply using data in this kind of feedback loop to understand how people are behaving has, is a really effective uh, way of using data that I think people aren't using enough of at the moment. Uh, and then it does come to segmentation and prediction as well. I think there's a lot of prediction modeling that is going on. Uh, there's entire businesses set up to do credit scoring using alternative data and using formal data. Uh, we also do work around churn prediction and conversion prediction to try and target marketing and to try and target incentives a bit better. So there is lots of work, but it can definitely be be done a lot more. I think that then feeds into this issue of data and the idea of if you have poor quality data, you're going to have poor quality whatever you do with it. So garbage in, garbage out is the kind of data science phrase. Uh, I think you're right. I think lots of this comes from data input and as you're saying, it's the quality of the data collector. I think there's a couple of other things to think about as well. So gameability. A lot of the time people, they're not just giving you data because they don't know or because your data uh, inputter has put it in wrong, but they're deliberately giving you the wrong answer to try and get something. And this often happens in credit. And this is the big problem that credit faces in particular is whenever it does surveys, people try and game it. I think last year, if you Googled Mshwari, which is the Mpower for Kenya, the second link was how do I increase my Mshwari limit? And it's things like you sit with your friend and you send 90 shillings to each other over and over again because there's no fee to do that amount and it increases your credit score. And you know people are very savvy about this at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think this is a huge issue. It's, there's nothing simple about it. Um, it's probably the first stage that businesses need to figure out is how to collect and store good quality data. And if you look at the kind of pyramid of what you can do with data, the first bit is storage. So how do you how do you create and store data in a way that is then usable? And if you don't solve that, you're not going to go forwards. Um, some methods that we use is always looking for objective sources of data. Self-reported data is always difficult, to be honest, uh, because people give you the answer they want. They try and game the system a bit. But you know, data like satellite data, uh, crop yields um, from crop cuttings. 
Uh, there's lots of data out there which is a bit more objective that we can that we can use. And then also making sure that data's been set up properly in SQL databases and it's not stored in 500 different Excels that are in different places with no ways to, to match between. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge and it's the first stage and people rush ahead to try and do the complicated stuff when they haven't sorted out the basics. And um, there's a few people that are working on kind of helping people just to set up the basics of data collection and storage. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I think I've extended my courtesy, so I will <laughs> close the panel at this point in time. Um, this discussion is not ended, though. I think we, as the custodians of the change in the agricultural sector, have to continue to have these conversations. Mumbaiko mentioned the same thing. We have to create the forums. We have to create the opportunities for us guys to interact and solve some of these challenges. We've not answered everything. I know many of you are feeling that I still need more answers. I still have more questions. I still have more to give to the conversation. Um, so let's create those platforms. Let's not wait for the agri-fins, the FSDs and all to set this up. It's very easy as a breakfast meeting between peers. A lot of things we did in the mobile industry was conversations amongst each other, saying, so, you know, we need to change this. I know right now there's a conversation between uh, a lot of the telcos and the regulator on the tips and the banks on the tips platform. It has to start somewhere, and you guys are actually the custodians of that change. So let's make it happen. Um, just to summarize a few of the things we discussed here, and it's very interesting, um, a lot of the stuff that's been discussed started the same way we started off with Digifarm in, in, in Kenya um, five years ago, five, four or five years ago. The challenge of partnerships. I mean, we discussed, they had a vision, they had, they had a, a strategy to get into the agricultural sector. But as usual, the strategy was them alone. Yeah? So the discussion of, look here, you cannot walk this journey by yourself. There are partners who can do other things better than you can, and you need to open the doors to those partners. You have presented a lot of the answers. What was the return on investment? What was the business case? Those are some of the factors. How did these people gel together? And then data. How did they start sharing data amongst each other? One of the biggest challenges early on in Digifarm was that data was not being shared well enough. And hence, the credit product had tremendous um, uh, non-performing loans. Yeah? Because there was not in enough information being fed to the scorecard. And the scorecard guys were saying, look here, we, we're, not, we're not scoring these guys correctly. Safaricom said, hey, I have to protect my customer data, etc., etc." I mean, there's a lot of these issues around data sharing. So a lot of the things you guys are talking about, they faced as well. And it took a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings, and we used to meet in actually FSDK, um, con concerted effort to actually get people to share the data, to understand um, the relevance of, info of how that information would help the whole product and the whole platform work together as a cohesive unit. And then moving forward, active use. Um, one of the biggest things that we saw was important of getting active use is having a field force. We know that digital cannot work alone. So you need to engage a field force in, uh, in a great way, in, in a smart way, to actually then get people to use digital tools. And how do you get a digital field force in a smart way? It's, of course, very expensive for you to pay for a field force to reach a million farmers. So you need to think of innovative ways, innovative incentives, and innovative models of actually utilizing local resources as your field force. I know we, we farm uses ambassadors in rural areas. Safaricom, Digifarm uses what they call di digital village advisors. They are VBAs, they are various rural agents. If we all started using these as a platform and say, look here, I can incentivize this rural agent to do one, two, three things for me. I can incentivize them. Then for that rural agent, they're getting enough income to sustain themselves and to be dedicated to the various service providers. It was the same story with mobile money. Yeah? Until we combined the services, not everyone had to roll out a, a mobile money or a Wakala agent. You got shared services and everyone can um, utilize one point. So you're maximizing on the opportunity in a rural area. In the same way, these field forces exist. Many institutions have rolled out field forces. They can be used to really drive the digital agenda, especially because they're youth, etc. So we've learned a lot of these lessons and a lot of the discussions we've had uh, are the same discussions we went through with Safaricom as they were building um, their solution towards what is Digifarm today. And a big challenge as well is do not fall back to your old ways of doing things. Even in this journey with Safaricom, 
they fell back and said, okay, now we'll build the technology platform that will manage the village advisors and we'll do it ourselves. It'll look at geotagging, it'll do all these things. So they keep, you keep falling back to that old way of doing things. And yet there's a solution out there that's much better, more efficient, has been tested in multiple markets, has already integrated to different data sources. And uh, believe you me, when we showed them the other platform, when they tried the other platform, I mean, they were embarrassed at what they had done internally. Agriculture is a seasonal thing. So by a certain time, yeah, farmers need their inputs. By a certain time, they need access to whatever resources they need. By a certain time, you need to harvest. And if you are promising the ecosystem, the market, that you will provide them these services, and you are unable to deliver because, one, you felt that you could build the best solution in-house, yeah, and didn't outsource, and then you fail the farmer, I mean, what a challenge will be to bring them back to accept digital, yeah? And that's a tough market, yeah? My final words. Farmers are using pangas, machetes, they're using jembes. This is just a small move from the Stone Age farming. It's a small move, yeah? We jumped from telephones, from typewriters, we're at a different level, and yet we've left this market so far behind. Who's going to change the way farming is, is happening in Africa? And it's up to us to start thinking. We cannot rely on the gem, but yes, it worked. So did telephones. Yeah? So did uh, letters. They worked okay. Yeah? But we've now made things so much better for ourselves. Our lives in the urban world are so much, it's so much better. The farmer is still where he was, just a step ahead of the Stone Age man. But what are we going to do to change that? Yeah? I leave that question and the ball uh, in the room, and I'll hand over to John to wrap up and close the day. Thanks, everyone, for the session, and give a warm round of applause to the panelists. Thank you.